Hello there and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Michelle Emerson and I am a fourth grade teacher in Maryland. A few weeks ago, I transitioned to hybrid teaching. So I am teaching both in-person students and virtual students at the exact same time, as crazy as that sounds. And I've gotten a lot of questions from you all. So in today's video, I'm going to be answering 10 of the most frequently asked questions about hybrid teaching. If you are not already following me over on Instagram at Pocket Full of Primary, make sure that you do because I am sharing a lot more about the day to day with hybrid teaching on there. We are going to jump right into it. The first question is from Preston Hazelden. I probably butchered that. How many students do you have in class and virtually? So I am teaching 12 students in person and 13 students virtually. I have 25 total students. It's pretty much half and half. Bridget Foley asked, what's your schedule like? Oh, well, our schedule has changed many, many times throughout the year with our current schedule that was created for hybrid learning. I only have the hybrid format on Mondays and Tuesdays. So we have cohorts of students and I only have one cohort. I only had 12 students from my class that signed up for in-person learning and each cohort comes two days a week. So they either come Monday, Tuesday, or they come Thursday, Friday. So technically I am only teaching hybrid on Monday and Tuesday. On Wednesdays, everyone teaches from home because they do a deep cleaning of the building and then on Thursday and Friday, some other teachers in the building will have students, but because I only have one cohort, I am at school but teaching all of my students virtually. However, that will be changing throughout the year because they are going to allow more families to opt in for that hybrid format. So most likely I will be getting a second cohort of students on Thursday and Friday. Now on Mondays and Tuesdays, we actually keep the same schedule time-wise throughout the week, but I'm just gonna go over Monday and Tuesday since those are the days I have students in person. My start time as a teacher is 8 a.m., but our students do not start arriving until 9.05. Schools across the county have staggered start times in order to allow for buses to transport all of the students, we do have one of the later start times for the schools in my county. From eight to nine is when we have various meetings. So I may have committee meetings or staff meetings or collaborative planning meetings. Then at 9.05, our in-person students start arriving. So they arrive between 9.05 and 9.25. Then at 925 is when our day officially begins. So that is when my virtual students will log on. From 925 to 945 is our like morning meeting, building community time. So usually my students are sharing what they did the night before. We are playing games, we're doing some social emotional learning lessons, and we're just focused on getting to know each other and building that classroom community. Then from 945 to 1040, so about 55 minutes, is our block one. Now now for me, I teach math during this time, but some of my team teachers are teaching reading during this time. And again, because of that hybrid format, I am teaching the same math lesson to my 12 in-person students and my 13 virtual students at the same time. Then from 1040 to 1130, so for 50 minutes, my students have cultural arts, which is like your specials, you know, your art, your PE, your media, your music. Now, because our cultural arts is remaining virtual, because otherwise they would be in contact with too many students and too many different classes, I am monitoring my in-person students during that time, but they are logged onto their Chromebook on Google Meet with their cultural arts teacher. Now with music, they're able to wear their headphones and I just hear random like clapping and stomping. And if they have to ask to go to the bathroom, I'm just kind of monitoring them during that time. But on Tuesdays I have PE and they cannot wear their headphones during PE. So I am actually logged into the Google Meet myself and I'm projecting it on my smart board. And when any student in class has to unmute, I have to turn my sound down. They unmute and talk, I turn my sound back up. So it's a very hectic time because I literally have to be in in the lesson so I know when I have to turn my sound down. Then from 1130 to 1225 is the second part of block one, which is either science or social studies. We rotate week to week. And again, I am teaching concurrently both my in-person students and virtual students at the same time. Now, 1225 until 150 is our midday break 
essentially. So my virtual learners log off. They are eating lunch at home and hopefully going outside, enjoying their break. My in-person students obviously are at school. So during this time, we have something called Literacy Engage, which is essentially a read aloud. We have lunch and we have recess. I am actually not in my classroom during this time. This is my lunch break and my planning time. So I have a midday monitor who comes into my room. For me, it's a TA that teaches in kindergarten. She comes into my room during this time and she handles the students during that Literacy Engage lunch and recess. I go to the gym and they have half the gym for teachers to eat lunch and half the gym set up for teachers to plan. So that's what I'm doing that during that time. Then at 1.50, I return to my classroom and we have something called Friends Fun and Flourish time from 1.50 to 2.15. Now this is an optional time for students, but obviously because my in-person students have no choice because they are at school, they are participating in this Friends Fun and Flourish time, but my virtual students do not have to log on during this time. I typically have Monday as a friends and fun time, which is more of like a lunch bunch. We socialize, we play games, and then Tuesday is flourish time, which is a chance to kind of get caught up on work or get extra help on assignments. Then at 2.15, all of my virtual learners have to log back on. And from 2.15 to 2.45, we have something called Academic Flex. And again, this rotates. So on Mondays, we have Academic Flex with our Block 1 teacher, which would be me. Tuesdays, they have Academic Flex with their Block 2 teacher. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Thursdays is Block 1 again, and then Fridays is Block 2. So this is a chance to finish any lessons because I feel like the time in the morning, because of navigating all the technology, it flies by. Sometimes it might be me doing some intervention. So if I felt like the students didn't get it, I'm going to go back and reteach. Or sometimes it's just independent work time for my students to get their assignments done. Then from 2.45 to 3.50 is our block two. Now, I already mentioned that my students attend their block two virtually because we are not able to trade classrooms. The students can't move rooms. So they have to log on with their block two teacher through their Chromebooks. So during this time, my in-person students are all on their Chromebook, logged in with their Block 2 teacher. I am at my desk, logged on to my laptop, teaching my Block 2 students virtually. So again, half of them are actually at school, they're just in another classroom, and then half of them are at home. So on Tuesdays, when my students do have Academic Flex with Block 2, that entire time from 2.15 all the way until 3.50, they are on their Chromebooks and I'm on my laptop. Then at 3.50, dismissal starts, so my virtual learners log off and my in-person learners grab their book bags, they put their Chromebooks away, they are supplied with a dinner and snack, so I'm handing those out. We're getting lined up and going outside for dismissal, and that usually lasts until about 4.10. I feel like that was very confusing, but hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> Abby underscore Briere, I probably did not say that correctly. How many days does each group of students attend per week? So as I mentioned, we can have up to two cohorts of students. So I could have half come on Monday, Tuesday and half come on Thursday, Friday. Even though I only have one cohort of students, they still only come two days per week because it would not be fair to other classes or grade levels if my in-person students came four days a week, but they have two cohorts so they can only come two days per week. So hopefully that makes sense. JSN005 asked, how do you track chat messages while moving about the room? So I'm actually very proud of this. I created myself a little cart. I will insert a picture of it. And I went into a little bit more detail in one of my previous videos about this cart. But essentially I have my laptop on top so that I can wheel it around the room with me while I am teaching my in-person students and virtual students. So I use that laptop as my camera and microphone for the Google Meet with my virtual students. And I carry it around the room with me so I can always see their faces. I can always see the chat and I can turn off the chat or turn it on as needed because my laptop is right in front of me. Now this cart I personally got from Ikea, but they do carry them at Michael's and Target. And I think they even have some on Amazon. So I will link some different options for you down below. Lucrezia.c.c asked how to create and balance assignments in person with no devices and remote learners. 
Personally, I have been focusing on administering my lessons the same way that I was when all of my students were virtual. I personally don't think that teachers should have to be designing two separate lessons. Focus on the digital component first and then find ways to adapt it for your in-person learners. As you all know, I have been using Nearpod to teach literally all of my lessons. I did create a previous video all about that, so I will link that for you down below if you are interested. But my virtual students are logged into the Nearpod and I'm also projecting that Nearpod on the board for my in-person learners. Now my in-person learners have a choice. They can get onto their Chromebook and join in the Nearpod. They're gonna see the same thing I'm projecting on the board, but they're able to draw on their screen to solve the problems if that's what they prefer. But they also have the choice to not join into the Nearpod and just solve the problems on their dry erase pocket or a dry erase board or a piece of paper and pencil. Now again, my in-person students are not logged into the Google Meet, but they do sometimes use their Chromebook to access some of those different technology resources or lessons that we are doing. But again, you can always print out like a template. So for example, if your virtual learners are doing something you've created on Google Slides, and maybe it's an organizer that they're completing, you can print out that slide and then just slip it into a dry erase pocket for your in-person students to use. That way they don't have to be on devices at all. If you were doing some type of a game, maybe like a Kahoot, you could always have your in-person students have maybe different colored cards or cards that say A, B, C, D, and they could just hold them up in order to answer. That way they don't have to join into the game through their Chromebook. And I keep saying Chromebook only because that's what my students use, but same thing goes for I iPad or laptop or whatever device they could possibly be using. Susan F. Andres, or maybe it's Fondres, I don't know, asked, how do you keep online students and in-person students engaged at the same time? So that definitely is difficult, okay? Don't get me wrong, but a few different strategies that I have used. Number one, I make sure that I call on my roomers and my Googlers, that's what I call them. My roomers are my in-person students. My Googlers are my virtual students. I make sure I call on them equitably. To make sure that I do this, I actually use something called wheelofnames.com. It is a free website and you can create a wheel that has your students' names. So I have one wheel for my roomers and one wheel for my Googlers. I will have both ones opened up in separate tabs and I will spin the wheel for my roomers and have them answer a question. And then I will spin the wheel to pick a Googler and have them answer a question. So that way, because I'm always going back and forth, my students are always engaged. Another strategy that I will use is I try to team up my in-person learners and my virtual learners. Sometimes I have them in breakout rooms. So I will have an in-person learner in a breakout room with a virtual learner. Previously, we were not able to use breakout rooms because we couldn't monitor all the students at once. But because my class is now half in-person and if I match them up, I can monitor them all through the screens of my in-person learners. I also sometimes will wheel my cart over to an in-person learner and I will have the in person learner and one of my Googlers play rock, paper, scissors against each other. So they will just go, all right, what ready, set, and then they'll do rock, paper, scissors, and whoever wins, the other person has to answer the question. So again, that's a way to kind of connect those students, but also be able to keep them engaged. And then finally, I'm using the same lessons that I was using before. So I'm still using Nearpod, and that allows my in-person students and my virtual students to engage in the same lesson. I can share out work from my in-person students, and I can share out work from my Googlers, and it just makes it really easy for them to still feel connected. JSN005 also asked, how do you create any collaborative work? Okay, I just mentioned that you can utilize breakout rooms. So you could connect an in-person student and a virtual student. Obviously that means that your in-person students do have to log on to Zoom or Google Meet, whatever video conferencing software you are using. I personally like to keep my in-person students off of the Chromebook as much as possible, but in order for them truly to collaborate, that is something that is helpful. So you could put them into a breakout room together and they could work collaboratively on a Google Jamboard or on Google Slides. So you could give them both access to the same document and that way they can talk together as they work through and complete it. 
Christy Nupple asked, how do you keep a sense of community between home learners and school learners? Okay, so I already mentioned a few things like having my cart wheel up to an in-person learner and having them play like rock, paper, scissors. But during that morning building community time, I will actually display the Google Meet on my board so my in-person learners can see my virtual learners. And then I will position my laptop so that my virtual learners can see my in-person learners and we will play games together, we will interact. Sometimes we do like a rumors versus Googlers. And even though it makes it seem like it's two different groups, the students actually really love it. And they are all still together virtually on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So they kind of enjoy that little sense of competition on the days when they are separate. So really for me, it just comes down to having that morning time for us all to connect together, be able to share things. And I make sure that I repeat things a lot. So if my in-person learners say something, I make sure I repeat it when I'm close to my laptop so my virtual learners can hear. That way they still feel like they're connected. But as much as possible, I will actually wheel that cart right up to one of my in-person learners. So if they're explaining how they solved a problem, I will have them right in front of the laptop so my virtual learners can see them and hear them and it just feels like they're more connected, if that makes sense. Okay, that kind of goes into this next question. Nick.grant.7739 asked, can students hear other students? So my in-person students can hear my virtual students pretty well. Because I am logged into the Google Meet on my laptop and my sound is on, whenever a virtual learner talks, their voice is coming out of my laptop and my in-person students can hear them. However, I have found if I'm at the front of the room with my laptop, my students in the back, it might be a little bit hard for them to hear the virtual learners. However, my virtual learners can almost never hear my in-person learners unless I scoot the laptop right up to their desk. So I repeat things a lot. Anytime my in-person students say something, I repeat it for my virtual learners. Anytime my virtual learners say something, I repeat it for my in-person learners. It does take time and it kind of slows the lesson down just a little bit, but at the same time, I do think it's beneficial for students to hear things more than once. And I think it's important to still have that sense of community by making sure that they can hear each other. And final question, ballet dancer Erin, paper homework versus online homework, what's the ratio that works best? Right now, under the current circumstances, my opinion is no homework. <laughs> I feel like kids are either on their Chromebook you know, more than they should be already. So I don't wanna give them like virtual homework. And honestly, we're so burnt out and tired by the end of the day. I know the whole hybrid format is exhausting. I don't want them to have paper homework either. So personally, I tell them go outside, go play, go, you know, socially distance and socialize with your neighbors or, you know, find ways to, to spend time with your family. I, that is more important to me than them doing homework, so none. <laughs> all right, that is it. Those were the 10 most frequently asked questions that I got from you all. Hopefully you enjoyed hearing my answers and got at least one new idea that maybe you could try out. If you have any other questions, go ahead and leave them down in the comments and I will do my best to respond to as many as I can. If you did enjoy this video though, please give it a thumbs up, share it out with your teacher friends. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button and notification bell so you do not miss any future videos. As always, thank you for watching. I love you all so much. Don't forget to put your positive pants on and I will catch you in the next one.